The title of the symposium is The Zima Meta a Multiverse. And the reason why we chose this title was to really give you an exhibition of all the functionalities of the Zima femtosecond laser. Now, we have a whole uh, panel of basically speakers um, where you're going to be hearing about the utility of the laser systems, both in transplantation and also in uh, 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 laser ablation uh, techniques and also basically in lenticle extraction uh, as well. And the idea is to really showcase the utility of this multimodal system. And also you see the speakers have come from all around the world. So basically this is a universal system that will work on patients, whether it's in Asia, whether it's in Europe, or it's basically in the United States as well. So. Without further ado, I'd like to invite our first speaker, uh, uh, Professor Payak, who's going to be talking about his experience with the Aquarius ablation laser. Professor Payak. <coughs> Dear colleagues, so um, I'd like to share the experience with uh, uh, Aquarius with uh, uh, solid state laser, which uh, we began it's more than two years ago. So it's always the same question. We have to evaluate the results forever, also the um, clinical outcomes and their application, and forever also the new technology, what, what we can see. So it was so for the first uh, 40 and 1 eyes. This is a little bit different than we have in the Excimer laser. We have a wavelength of uh, 205 to 215 nanometers. It is a different dynamic on the cornea, we, you will see. The repetition rate and uh, eye tracker system in, are in the modern, as we know it from the uh, other uh, systems we use daily. I show you some pictures regarding the dynamic what happens during the procedure. We have on the left side the situation that after cutting with the Z8. We dry the cornea in the middle, this picture on the right side, you see as the fluid is built up during the ablation process. You see how the uh, fluid comes to the surface. And during the procedure you have a surface with liquid which is uh, covered. And on the picture on the right side, you see the results as you know from the femto LASIK. So we make a retrospective uh, case report, uh, single use, single surgeon chart review uh, of 41 consecutive myopic eyes of 23 patients. Uh, we use uh, the Aquarius and we make the follow up on the first day, one week, one month, and three months. Surely we have also patients which we have to follow up, which is uh, much longer, and so we make it in our institution. Take a look at the video first. You see the workflow is well done here with the femtosecond laser of the left side, and there's enough space to put the laser head of the femtosecond laser uh, uh, at, the, at the eyes. So after the cut, you will see the dynamic, what happens with the fluid. So we open the same eyes as you see on the pictures before. <clears throat> and so the surface, we dry it up. And now we begin with the procedure. And you see the fluid comes from the cornea to the surface and it's nearly no absorption uh, by the laser. So we have the refraction afterwards. It's completely different than we know from the eczema laser. At the end of the procedure, as you know, you dry it and put the flap on the um, coronal bed. I'd like you to present you some results. Um, the safety index, it's important uh, during the procedure. You have an index which begins with 0 0.79 and increasing then up to 1.0 after three months. What is important, we see that the uh, visual acuity, the corrected, decreases on the first day. And the reason is not the laser, it's more the immediately um, examination after contact lens removal. We don't 
for each patient the contact lensing during the night and take it out and make so the um, visual acuity the next morning. What you see afterwards, uh, we have a quite well log bar visual acuity of 0 0.07 after three months. That's very well. What's about the refraction? The refraction, we begin in mean. I take the mean refraction that's on the uh, bottom uh, with minus 2.1. Uh, and you see the refraction is during the, uh, the time, the follow-up, very stable. We have maybe a slightly um, under correction of minus uh, 0.2, but that, uh, that could be it's only 41 eyes. Maybe it, it's better than uh, if you have more patients. But it's a very, very good result. Um, the other both, uh, pictures, uh, graphs on the left side, you see the manifest sphere on the right side, the cylinder. But the cylinder which we have correct is uh, just minus 68. But we have now also patients where we corrected also um, astigmatism of more than three diopters, and it works as well. Just to show you the corneal OCT, you see there's nearly no uh, difference uh, after one day and one month. You see a very well uh, part, uh, the cut of 110 microns, and it is quite, it's no scars. But if we uh, take the microscopic confocal with lasers, you see, as we also know from the eczema laser, an edema, a small edema, which uh, disappears during the follow up after 10 days. After one month, there's nothing anymore. Why a solid state laser? No gas is needed. That's today a very important point. And uh, it potentially uh, seems to have less dependent on the ambient conditions. Also, the, wave light, uh, the wavelength is different from the eczema laser, so the hard advantages. So that this is hydration, maybe that we will see in the future, uh, there should be uh, less haze, less um, scars, and thermal effects, which we also um, see uh, with the uh, eczema laser. <coughs> Potentially, a uh, solid state laser have a longer uh, source lifetime normally, and uh, the other things you see improve the reliability and efficiency. And forever, if you switch on, then it's the a period to a short time to ready period. We come to the conclusion. Also, what we have seen, the ablative solid state laser treatment shows promising initial uh, clinical results. In myopic patients, we already not now did uh, hyperopic patients that we will uh, uh, publish in the future. The wet ablation procedure greatly facilitates the intraoperative irritation management of the cornea and um, well integrated in the surgical uh, workflow. And forever, what is very important in the daily uh, application is the system is easy to use, is very intuitive on the screen. Thank you for your attention. Please. So we'll, we'll do the questions at the end of the session, so please keep your questions for the individual speakers, there's some microphones, and then we'll carry on with the rest of the session as well. Okay, so it's my pleasure now to invite our next speaker, who's gonna be uh, Su uh, Susan Jacob, who's gonna be basically talking at CARES, a procedure that she invented herself and was the first person to do this in the world, and she's gonna be talking about some new adaptations of using this with a femtosecond laser. Thanks, Susan. Thanks a lot, Joe, the, and I'm really happy to be here at this Zymer Symposium. Uh, you know, uh, when we look at keratoconus, it's really important to know why it's so uh, important to treat it. Uh, you know, the, the incidence that we kind of assume is that it's very low, but recent studies have shown that the incidence can be really high. In India, it's thought to be up to 1 in 43 patients. In a study in Riyadh, it was thought to be 1 in 21 patients. Netherlands, 1 in 375 patients. Africa, also a very high percentage in both males and females. And so the, 
the, the incidence is really much higher, the prevalence is really much higher than we think it is. And so it's really important to start looking at uh, uh, really good treatment options for these patients. And the CARES, I think, is one of the, uh, one of the uh, stepping stones to possibly better and better treatments that uh, we can finally get for these patients. Uh, the age of these affected patients is um, almost always young, and they're progressive in nature, easily treatable, and therefore it's really important to have better and better treatments to treat these patients. Now, when you look at treatment modalities, you can basically divide them into invasive and minimally invasive. And invasive, of course, includes the penetrating keratoplasties, DALCs, small aperture optics, refractive lens exchange, phakic lenses, and so on. And minimally invasive includes cross-linking, which is, of course, a given, and other techniques which can also improve the shape of the cornea, like CARES, ICRS, and topography-guided PRK. Now, of course, minimally invasive is uh, uh, almost always the first preference of choice because of the simple reason that it is minimally invasive. And if you compare corneal rings, which would include both ICRS and CARES and topography-guided PRK, you'll see that uh, the corneal rings are much more physiological, uh, whereas with the uh, topography-guided or PTK, PRK uh, with CXL treatments, uh, you're basically removing more corneal tissue, and so your treatment is basically exactly the same as the cause of the pathology. The effect on pachymetry, corneal rings has, ICRs has, uh, and uh, CARES do not have any thinning effect, and CARES, in fact, thickens the cornea with the same material, that is corneal tissue itself. Uh, Topography-guided PRK or PRK CXL uh, actually thins the cornea. Uh, the effect on progression is also better because all the corneal rings produce a false limbus effect, whereas there's no false limbus effect, so there's no protective effect and a possible deteriorative effect in uh, PRK PTKs with CXL treatments. Also, most importantly, you can get a large magnitude of effect with corneal rings, and especially with CARES, as I'll show you, unlike, uh, to, unlike the PRK PTK PSC XL treatments where the effect is really small, uh, you have uh, desirable, uh, it's very desirable to combine with CXL, but in, uh, in PRK PTK, you really have to absolutely combine it because otherwise you will likely get progression. And also haze formation, uh, with, when you combine with the rings and CXL, you actually decrease the incidence of haze. But when you combine with PRK and CXL, is there an increased haze? And the role of mitomycin C in this has very well been explained by uh, Sherry Award. So when we're talking so much about sustainability in this conference and in, the, in, the, in this time, you know, we really have to look at more sustainable treatment options for uh, keratoconus. And I think corneal rings really uh, does play an important role. Here is an example of a TGPRK with CXL where uh, the patient showed uh, progression over uh, four to five years. And you can see that there was extreme thinning and almost up to 232 uh, microns in this area. And what we did in this patient was put in a CARES exactly in this area, and that allowed us to flatten the cornea as well as thicken the cornea in this uh, same area, allowing us to also safely cross-link him at the same time. So when you also combine ring, compare ring and uh, CARES, uh, uh, the ICRS synthetic segments and CARES, we of course know that uh, synthetics are synthetics and therefore they're not biocompatible or biointegrable, uh, whereas allogenic tissues got all these advantages. Also, you have to kind of limit yourself to large optic zones with the synthetic segments, whereas you can go small, even up to four millimeters uh, without glare or halos uh, with CARES. Uh, the depth of implantation has to be necessarily deep with synthetic segments, whereas you can have superficial implantation with CARES. Efficacy is less, where with CARES you can really get much more efficacy because you can put in a lot of thick tissue there and get flattening, whereas in, in synthetic ICRS you would be scared about uh, extrusions and melts in case you put very thick segments. So you can use uh, synthetic ICRS in mild to moderate ectasia, but here you can use it in the entire range of keratoconus, right from mild to advanced ectasias, and you can often replace DALC with this, uh, with this technique. And also remember that the safety margin of CARES is much higher, especially in patients who may progress or, or, or who are eye rubbers or who are very young patients, whereas the safety margin may be lower in synthetic segments because of the progression. So uh, the relevance of CARES, uh, it's definitely come to occupy its own definitive and expanding role in the treatment of ectatic disorders, and there's a large number of countries where this is being done now. Uh, this was our first paper on, uh, on uh, CARES, and uh, we're now uh, basically doing a lot of customized CARES, and I'd just like to show you how we do this. We uh, draw the, uh, the map, the plan on the topographic or the keratometric map of the patient, and this is a CARES customizer template which I've designed, and uh, basically it has all the optic zones marked on it uh, as 3, 4, 4.5, 5, 5, 5 6, 6.5, all the way up to 12, and also all the meridia and the uh, clock hours, and what we do is cut out the CARES segment, place it on the optic zone, which is as per the plan and mark out our plan on this. Uh, uh, basically, we have a, a segment which is uh, uniform thickness and then a part which is tapered out. So this exactly matches this uh, plan and this is what we implant into the patient. So here is... Uh, Previously, uh, these are longitudinally cut allogenic segments of uniform thickness that are similar to intacts. 
So as I said, we, when we started out, we started out with uniform thickness Though scares. Though we obtained but now good results from standard thickness. uniform thickness scares, the possibility of tweaking the results still further by customizing cares to the individual patient's topography and refraction was an exciting one. We therefore used customized cares in patients with asymmetric keratoconus. This was done by shaping cares according to their topographic and refractive needs. The uniform thickness cares was marked and using a special cares customizer instrument that we designed ourselves, we were able to mark the segment according to the desired optic zone and degree or clock hour. We could then cut the exact shape that was required according to the patient's keratometric gradient and then insert it intrastromally into the patient's cornea. Customized cares includes asymmetric or <coughs> symmetric, specifically shaped cares that are prepared and these can be of progressive or variable thickness, progressive or variable width or combinations. In addition, change in shape or transition zone can be created to have sudden change or gradual taper and variations in shape or thickness may be along a defined extent or along the entire arc length. As obvious, in progressive ectasias, CARES is combined with corneal cross-linking to stabilize progression. We custom Basically, as you saw with CARES, we can really get a large amount of uh, customization in terms of shape, width, etc., which, uh, are, uh, which uh, you, know, you do have uh, asymmetric segments and synthetic ICRS also, but these are kind of available in uh, fixed, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, fixed types alone, which uh, generally have a gradation right from one edge to the other or from the center to the periphery, but not this amount of extensive or exquisite customization that you can do. So here you see a customized CARES where you can see the uh, thickness is progressive increasing 260 microns 387 403 and 519 depending on which zone you are uh, taking the scan from and that's what you can do and as I explained with synthetic ICRS you have fixed gradations and, and fixed arc lens and fixed optic zones whereas with CARES this is basically in your hand and you can really do uh, a lot of customization based exactly on each individual patient's plan for example you could have a, a, a large uniform uh, thickness zone here with a small taper or you could have a taper all around and you could uh, vary the optic zone depending on what you like, the arc length depending on what you like. So this is how uh, CARES really helps us a lot. Uh, this is a patient who's got a, a narrow edge tapered CARES and you can see that uh, we ha also have a gradation in the flattening achieved uh, depending, on the, uh, de depending on the thickness of the volume of tissue that is implanted. So I was very happy to work with Zima. Uh, to try and to try, try and develop this uh, this software also for the Z8 platform, and we uh, did this in Bombay with Dr. Kumar doctors at Dr. Kumar doctors clinic, and. Uh, this is uh, the great time that we had with the team here, uh, Fabian and Dominique and uh, everyone else from Zima. So this is the, uh, the uh, software, which uh, is really nice and uh, quick because uh, you have this vacuum built up and there's an OCT, an integrated OCT, which lets you see the cut as it is happening. So that's, that's a live OCT view that you get. And, uh, and then once that is cut, you basically, sorry about that, also have a, a very good uh, you know customization of the channel within the patient's eye because unlike all the other femtosecond lasers where you are forced to have a 360 degree channel with Zima you can actually keep the arc of the tunnel exactly how much you want uh, and of course as in all others you can also vary the optics on the thickness and so on so here are some examples of uh, femto customized cares which we created using the Zima platform the Z8 and uh, here you can see this one is uh, basically a uniform thickness cares, but on the other side you can see a customized cares which has a, a narrow edge at one end and uh, these can just be easily <coughs> picked off uh, from the donor eye uh, as, as uh, in femtosecond lasers it just comes off as butter, the dissection quality is very good and then we are able to go and uh, implant it in. So here is a post-operative anti-segment OCT of uh, a patient in which we implanted a femtocares, and uh, these are some of the segments here. Uh, you can have different arc lengths, you can cut uh, different uh, amounts, different numbers and different types of uh, segments within the same donor cornea. And uh, here are uh, some examples of all the segments that we'd cut. This is a surgery, surgical video of uh, implantation of the femtocares that we cut with the Z8 platform. And you can see that uh, this is the degree uh, zone marker, uh, and we are marking the corneal, uh, coaxially sighted corneal light, light reflex, and then we go ahead and mark the, uh, the uh, area in which we want to implant the segment. And we've already dissected the femto channel, 
as per this plan and you can see this is uh, the femtocares which has been left out to dehydrate a bit uh, just like uh, Shari Awad has described uh, which is the jerky technique and it's just got published in the Konya journal and uh, you can see that here it just goes in just similar to plastic so for all of you who are wondering how does the soft tissue get inserted easily into this uh, femtosecond channel uh, it can very easily be dehydrated and then pushed in uh, pushed in easily into the femtosecond channel and uh, and if you're in a bit of a hurry and you want to do it really fast and not wait for the dehydration you can also quite easily uh, put it in uh, using the curved rods and the curved uh, reverse in skis, the curved Y and the curved reverse in skis which we've designed uh, and that can also help you get the care segments in quickly. So this is again the post-op showing the customized uh, segment inside and you can see it very clearly. Uh, and uh, Badr Khayat also has done the circular cares uh, which is basically a full circle uh, which is put post-operative images showing great flattening and anti-segment OCT images and uh, that's, that's basically about uh, uh, my experience with the Zymer. We've also used this in post classic ectasias and uh, we've done centrally tapered cares as you can see in this OCT machine, also giving you uh, uh, more uh, flattening in the adjacent areas and less flattening in the inter intervening area. We've used this for astigmatism in thin corneas and also we've been able to use it in very steep corneas and very thin corneas where uh, ICRs would food. not have been possible. Uh, also, extremely extreme flattening can be got with the cares, uh, basically allowing you to replace it with DALC. And I think with that, I will come to the end of my presentation. Uh, one of the advantages of uh, Zima, of course, is that it has uh, it works in the nanojoule uh, range and with a megahertz frequency. So that gives you these very close cuts, which makes it uh, very very less traumatic and less inflammatory for the uh, patient's eye, and the uh, and and you can get very good results and very clean dissection. Thank you so much. Thanks, Susan. Can I have my slides? So I'm going to be talking, keeping on the theme of sustainability. I'm going to be talking about um, um, green transplantation. So I'll try to feed you into my thinking, basically, for this as well. So obviously, all of you are aware we're in the middle of a sustainability crisis with the climatic uh, changes around the planet. When I landed in Dubai on the way here, it was 44 degrees outside uh, at the airport, and many of you have seen high uh, skyrocketing temperatures basically around the world. And one of the ways, of course, you can reduce emissions or carbon emissions is becoming a vegetarian, and we know the effect of basically meat with respect to get its um, uh, carbon basically footprint you can see from this chart over here uh, compared to basically vegetables and of course one of the vegetables that most of people who like myself who basically turned into become a vegetarian now uh, that we basically will eat will be some mushroom basically based uh, uh, um, uh, uh, vegetable and one thing about mushrooms they can come in all different shapes and sizes but one thing you'll see characteristically is this typical shape of basically a large anterior surface and basically a store <laughs> So you're thinking, well, hang on, how are we going to apply this to our transplantation? And of course, we can have mushroom transplants as well. And this is the, now is the time to basically think about why we should basically be looking about converting to basically doing mushroom transplantation. Now, we know femtosecond laser has been using keratoplasty for many years, probably over about 12 to 15 years, and we can do a whole array of different configurations with respect to the side cuts. And basically, they've shown the sort of better apposition, better wound healing responses, slightly better wound strip. But in the long term, to be frank, they haven't really showed a, an improvement in results, certainly when you start basically removing basically the stitches. Um, however, more recently, there's been a really looking at this in a little bit more detail about the advantage of doing basically mushroom cuts, specifically mushroom basically dogs with respect to early visual acuity and really reducing your basically irregular astigmatism on the ocular surface with improvements in uncorrected and best spectacle corrected visual acuity. And more recently, for Massimo Busin series over here, you showed better visual acuity outcomes. And really, it was the reduction in irregular astigmatism when you combined a nine and a six millimeter clearance in basically the central areas. So, of course, the problem with this, once you've basically done that side cut, of course, you still need to do a tunnel in order to basically get a big bubble to basically do the stromal replacement. And that's the limitation with basically femtosecond laser technologies when you're just basically using a side cut um, alone and no basically tunnel formation. So a few years back, I presented this at ESCRS, I think before COVID 2019, where we worked with basically Theo Silas group. And basically we showed the advantage of a tunnel formation using the Z8 from the second laser and doing basically extensive laboratory studies that we basically did in Singapore, basically on pig eyes and also basically on human eyes. We were able to basically show that you were able successfully to be able to not only create the tunnel, but successfully get a basically big bubble uh, formation once the tunnel was basically created. 
Uh, then basically following a case series uh, from Theo's group, we basically able to show this successfully in about a series of uh, 14 cases published back in 2019 of basically being able to achieve uh, the big bubble formation, albeit basically with a straight cut. So you can see on the video, you can use the intraoperative OCT uh, underneath the scar to help you basically with the tunnel formation. And basically once the tunnel is basically created underneath this straight cut and basically then peeled from the surface, you can then put your dark cannula in in order to basically get your big bubble. And in this pilot series, the results seem to be quite satisfactory and the results were basically pretty good with the straight cut tunnel. And this has been uh, shown, Boris's paper uh, published recently in 2023, showed an improvement in the, his success rate of using a laser tunnel from 36.4% to 65.65% with respect to the creation of basically a big bubble. So it shows you that the tunnel can actually basically add to the surgery. Now, of course, what we wanted to do is, is can we attach this to basically using a mushroom? Now, this is a bit more complicated geometry as well in order to basically do this. And the significant advantages of basically having a mushroom on the surface, you have the refractive advantage, so a less astigmatism. You have the mechanical advantage of basically beta wound healing. And of course, even though you're close to the limbus, these are all basically dull cases, so we don't have to basically worry about rejection as we do with penetrating keraplasty. The other key advantage is obviously the central area can be between 6 and 6.5 millimeters, so it reduces your risk of basically rupturing and of course when you if you can use a tunnel you have a preset air injection basically depth and when you're doing your suturing which we know is a cause of basically perforation you're suturing at a much more superficial level itself so it basically combines the advantages of mushroom but also with the advantages of basically tunnel so again, last year, at the end of last year, we went back to the wet lab. So we did a whole series of wet lab studies on basically porcine and all, on also human size, uh, human eyes to look at the accuracy of basically the tunnel formation. And this is the first patient that underwent surgery uh, last year. So you see it's a 53-year-old uh, Chinese lady, intolerant basically contact lens wear. And the idea was basically to do a femto basically dog for her. So this is the case. So a lot of the programming has to be done basically beforehand with respect to the shape. Then again, using the intraoperative tunnel. So you're gonna cut the tunnel first before you will basically cut the lamella cut for the mushroom interface cut as well. Now you do need to optimize the tunnel width depending on the, can uh, the cannula that basically you're using uh, for your dog. I use a cannula basically made by Asico and I'm quite happy to share our settings basically for this as well. So once it's cut the tunnel, it's then cutting the lamella part of the mushroom cut. It's then cutting the anterior surface. You can see basically on the schematic over here, and then it's gonna basically cut the side cut of basically uh, the mushroom as well. So once it's basically cut the side cut going up onto the surface, uh, you can then simply basically peel off basically the cut in the mushroom uh, configuration. Of course, remember you have to use an AC maintainer to cut the donor as well in the same configuration of the mushroom uh, as well. Okay, so we go basically back to the patient. So this you can simply peel off the anterior surface. Uh, typically, I know my position of basically the tunnel. You can use OCT. That's showing you the tunnel entrance. Use a Sinsky hook. You put your cannula basically into the tunnel. You can see the demarcation over here is 6.5 millimeters, and then the outer surface is 8.3 basically millimeters, and then you can basically uh, get your uh, big bubble formation, and then the rest of the surgery is basically as per standard basically dog surgery, but you're only clearing the central 6.5 millimeters, and you, but your astigmatism is going to be on 8.3 millimeters across the surface. Okay, so this is that first patient, pretty good with acuity, basically outcome as well, and you can see the regular surface basically as we basically did selective suture removal on his surface. So people said to me, John, well, you know, that's okay for keratoconus, right? Because keratoconus, you've got clear cornea. So we did a whole series of keratoconus cases, but then we thought, okay, let's see how well this laser can do. So we started pushing it. We can do it for granular corneal dystrophy, and we can do it for mucopalosarcoidosis as well. You do need to adjust the laser settings a little bit but to increase the energy in order to basically get that tunnel cut. And of course, as we've got more and more experienced over the last eight months, basically using this technique, we started basically pushing the limits, and I'll show you a bit more complicated case in the next slide. So when you're cutting the donor, it does depend on your donor donor tissue a little bit. So when I cut the donor, because my tissue is a little bit older, it's about 10 to 12, 14 days older, typically it's a little bit swollen. So what they will do is that they will do OCT uh, guiding basically with the cutting as well. It is important to get your configuration, obviously, of your mushroom similar in the donor and the recipient. When we do a keratoconic case, I do the recipient first, and then I cut the donor. When I do a standard case, I'll do the donor first, and then I'll basically cut the recipient um, afterwards. And generally, it's quite easy to basically uh, peel off uh, from the surface as well. So I'll show you this case where we did recently, about six, eight weeks ago. It's a 19-year-old Malay boy. You can see the scarring over here on the anterior surface. It's a 78-diopter, uh, 78, uh, 78 basically, cone. So we listed him basically for a mushroom dunk. So obviously the key thing here is how you're going to get a tunnel underneath that basically scar. 
So what we did was is that initially I basically planned that basically the tunnel configuration on laser just using the OCT just to give you an idea on the depth of this scar. He had no history of previous hydros, but you can see the depth of the scar over here. So what I did was I adjusted the tunnel, obviously using the intraoperative OCT, away from the edge of the scar so that the anterior surface is well basically positioned around the level of the scar. But the edge of the tunnel you can see over here is just near the beginning of the scar. Okay, and I got them to increase the energy a little bit on basically the tunnel formation so I knew that we were going to be able to create the, uh, the tip of the tunnel close to the area of the scar. And I obviously knew this bit of the um, tunnel would be fine because it's well away basically from the scar formation. Typically, I will change the interface normally about 150 microns uh, away from Decimase membrane. So when you do your programming of the laser, you have to remember the laser calculates from the anterior surface, but the surgeon calculates from Decimase membrane. So it's the opposite way around. So this is the basically laser cut. It's cutting exactly the same way as I basically uh, showed you previously. So it's done basically the lamella cut on the side of the mushroom, and basically now it's basically going onto the anterior uh, surface. So this was a 384 micron cornea. So obviously where it's slightly sticky over here in the scar, you can see how well it basically peels off. So even with that dense scar, you can still basically peel off this surface. And this is a 384 micron cornea, 70 um, eight diopters. So you can still peel it off with basically a Sinsky hook. Then, so it just shows you basically on the OCT on the side over here where the, where the scar basically is cut right underneath the level of the scar, basically on the surface. Then we'll basically put our cannula in the preset tunnel. So you can go, see it goes right up to the level of where that scar is. So the tunnel cut very accurately with respect to the positioning. And then we basically inject the bubble to basically get our, our big bubble. And the rest, as everybody says, is history because we just can remove the stroma and then put the graft on surface. So this is the same patient now. He's basically, this is a one month post op. I took this picture from him. He's 6'9 plus 2 vision. So you've got a nice, basically regularized surface uh, on the surface. And of course, suturing with the mushroom is very simple because you're suturing well away from the uh, posterior uh, decimase membrane. So the use of femtosecond laser keraplasty has shown better wound healing strength, faster healing, and less postoperative astigmatism using a mushroom configuration. The, the introduction of the intraoperative guided tunnel creation is really disruptive in the field of basically lamella surgery. And what we can show you now is that basically you can combine this with the topographic advantages of using basically a monk mushroom dog, aka uh, basically green transplantation, and offers significant advantage with respect to profile and basically achieving of the bubble. We had a very high success rate when I've done these cases in standard basically cones. And even in those scarred cases, I've still been able to hit over 90% uh, big bubble formation. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so I'd like to invite the next speaker, who's going to be Teo. He's going to be talking about everything all at once. Thanks, Teo. Thank you very much, Jod. Thank you very much uh, to the company of Zima for giving me the opportunity to talk on this. Um, on the other hand, I was invited to give that talk for um, what are you doing with the laser? And I said, well, I'm basically doing everything with that laser. Um, so we decided to um, give a brief uh, introduction into my daily routine. And uh, as you can see from affiliations, I not, don't only have one affiliation, but rather six affiliations. And in each of the affiliations, one Z, um, one Zima laser is available. So here's my financial disclosure. And uh, I would like to start. Um, with that entire relationship, how it started. That was back in my fellowship at uh, Wellman Center for Photomedicine in Boston in 2016, where the company Zima was um, um, provided me one at six for research purposes. So this was my first laser. You see, I had a bit more hairs. It's going more into one direction of my father with the hairs. And the other thing, <coughs> where I did my first femtolasic on, that was a rabbit. And at that time, I tried to evaluate whether cross-linking and uh, LASIK can be combined together and whether there is a ben uh, benefit. However, there were a few starting problems. The first thing is rabbit eyes are much smaller than eyes, so we needed to design a custom interface. Yeah. And yes. since I haven't done any LASIK before in 2016, I needed to have a good teacher, so I invited my father and asked him whether he could help me with the rabbit eyes to perform the surgery. And in the end, it looked like this. You've seen that flap, the tzema was, was pretty fine in, in, in creating that flaps in the rabbits. As I said in the beginning, we had some suction problems due to the small eyes. However, today it's a bit, a little bit different, the femtolasics that I perform. I don't perform them on rabbits anymore. I perform them on humans. And uh, here I would like to show the first case in my daily routine where I use the Zima Z8 and what benefits we have. You can see it here. We start, we do the applanation, and then I'll start the suction soon, as I see here. And now you see it's slightly decentered. So, then the first thing what we can do due to the applanation mode, we can slightly laterally de-center 
the flap, that's the first thing. The next thing that is coming, what the benefit of this laser is, we can do an interoperative OCT, what we've seen from the two speakers also before. And as soon as we have that OCT, you will see I did a 90 micron flap. I can double check, in particular in, in, in specific cases with a thicker epithelium, whether a 90 micron flap or 80 micron flap is feasible or not. And here you can see the clear demarcation between the epithelium and the, um, and the, the flap dissection, so we know that we are sure underneath the epithelium and don't get a, get a um, cutting error in that case. So here we can clearly see, also what we see is that the side cuts are very nicely within that region, so even if we do a relift, we don't get any, or have a very low chance of getting any um, epithelia in growth, and we can also change the size of the flap in case we'll see that um, the applanation is not complete. Here the same, and then I think the rest is fine. And as I said already, the patient was not a rabbit, but a human, and the human was afterwards pretty satisfied. However, we can do refractive. We've heard a lot, and we will hear afterwards another refractive application, but we can also do therapeutic, cataract, and of course, lenticular extraction. Um, I don't want to talk too much, but that's also daily routine. That we, what you see here, a dissection with a Z8, that was one of the first eyes um, two years ago. And uh, you'll see the dissection quality of that lenticule is pretty good. Above and underneath, I just prepare the first pocket, go in, you'll see also here the dissection quality of the lenticule is pretty smooth, can easily dissect it with the instrument. Also the posterior plane, pretty easy to dissect and afterwards just the removal of the lenticule. And you can have done the entire clear procedure within less than five minutes. However, you can also do the opposite. We've seen that that laser is also capable of doing other things. For example, here we have a hyperop, a hyperopic patient, six diopters, regular corneal anterior surface with a shallow anterior chamber, so we can't provide any options to this patient. Can't provide, that's not really true. You can see here the postoperative curvature, and that was one month after the surgery and the difference map, and we um, got this patient from six diopters with a, with a like procedure from 0 0.3 up to 0 0.9 one month post-op. And again, the Siemens laser was able to provide help for us. Here you can see the applanated cornea, just speed it up a little bit with the OCT, and we, create, we, we cut a lenticule in the anterior part of the, of the stroma and uh, designed that lenticule. Afterwards, you'll see the lenticule implantation. We made a 10 millimeters flap. We first marked everything on the lenticule, as you can see here on the left. Sorry. Right. As you can see here on the left, we marked the center of the lenticule. We uh, marked the first Purkinje image due to those dots. We unfolded the graft and did this additive hyperopic procedure. Just um, assured that the stromal side of the lenticule is on, bar is, is, uh, on the stromal side of the flap so that the touch up for any topography away from guided treatments after which is easier, can close it, and you have done with this laser also hyperopic additive procedures. However, we don't only, we, 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 it's not only the cornea that this laser is able to do, we can also do cataract surgery, and um, that's what I wanted to show you here. It's also, just speed it up a little bit, you'll do the applanation, you'll see that there is a marking, so there's also a astigmatic correction included. Due to the OCT, you, we can see that um, we can determine the capsulotomy that we want to do. And in addition, we can also see the cornea, so we're also doing some astigmatic keratotomies combined in the same procedure. You'll see here the OCT with the safety distance of the posterior surface of the cornea. And finally, the rotation. And afterwards, the surgery is done. You see the consecutive steps, what the laser does. And you see with the applanation of uh, the vacuum time, in less than four minutes, everything is done. That's then the picture. Afterwards, you'll see the nice four quadrants, but you can also um, go up to 16 quadrants. Um, Zimmer has there a lot of option to customize your flags. The last thing where we can go, we go back to the, um, uh, to the cornea with the keratoplasty. We've seen that we can do applanating keratoplasty, what Jod already um, um, nicely presented, but we can also do 
in a liquid interface keratoplasty, this means that we don't need to squeeze the cornea into a condition which is not physiological and uh, respectively induce a post-operative, not a round, nicely round-shaped transplant, but rather an elliptic transplant due to the shape as a, 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 a symmetry of the cornea. And this is what I wanted to show you here. Again, this laser is performing the OCTs. So, wait, just show this to you here. Performing the OCTs, we clearly see where we want to cut. We can induce an uncut area so that the, um, that the eye is not open sky immediately after the surgery. And you can just perform this without any aplanation of the cornea. But the other thing what we can also do is the, is the femtodal. Jord already showed this. Um, I also would like to go to the straight uh, keratoplasty, and this is a macular corneal dystrophy where I performed the femtodal. Um, you will see here that the cornea has a high opacification in the anterior part. You can even see this here on that or fast view. And again, you will see that the tunnel is nicely, you can, um, it's nicely 30 microns above the decimates membrane. And also here, the laser does its job very nice as a dissection, as you've seen before. And um, the thing what I wanted to show here is the dissection quality of the tunnel. We first go in with the cannula. You can see this pretty easy. Now there's some water. You push it a little bit forward. And afterwards, you do the big bubble, as we've seen before. Um, I started roughly three years ago with femtodalks, and uh, I have to say that in the beginning it was quite a steep learning curve. I was a little bit too respectful with the tissue. I was too far away from decimates membrane. I wasn't able to reach in the beginning such high numbers of big bubbles, to be honest. That was, I'm not sure how you had this job, but um, I was when I was 50 or more micrometers away from decimates membrane. It only worked maybe in 50, 60 percent of the cases. Since I'm going really close to decimates membrane in the range of 30 microns, I um, achieve a quite a high rate of, um, um, of big bubbles. Um, here I want to show that's a systematic analysis. We're also going to publish our results in the next year. However, this has been published by Boris Maljugan, and he found the same observation as, he, as, as we did, that the big bubble formation was significantly higher when using the tunnel and that femto second laser-assisted dulk. Um, the other thing was surgery time and conversion rate, however, not significantly, but that was also something what we mentioned, uh, measured, and the endothelial cell count, which was better, but that's, I think, um, clear if you have to manipulate less. Um, here are my femto dulks from um, 2022, 2023. I, on purpose, did not include my first dulk since um, I also already told you that the learning curve is, is, is quite flat in the beginning when you start with dulks, and so I didn't want to include those results. From the 30 femto dulks I've done in the past, um, in the past uh, uh, one and a half years, with and with it, with it, sorry, with a distance of 30 microns anterior to decimates membrane, so quite risky. Um, what I thought in the beginning but I didn't have any perforation during those two years. Um, I achieved 28 big bubbles, so it had a success rate of more than 90%, so similar to yours, Jod, um, not 100%, but um, this sometimes you also have the tricky cases with scars and stuff like that. However, that big bubble rate, if, if you achieve a big bubble, it does not guarantee to you that you'll have also a successful dulk. So out of those 30 dulks, I only achieved in 25 a successful end of the, of the, of the dulk, because if you do have some scars, um, you may also have a rupture of Destimates membrane, and therefore you may need a conversion. In the end, I would like to show a nice, since I'm working at six locations, I would like to show you um, a nice video of what I've done with Seema and uh, maybe how my um, relation with the Z8 continues. This is one center in Basel, as you can see here, where I have my first date with uh, the Z8. Then we go over to Berlin within the next year. It's going to be our second date. Then Dusseldorf, there I'm already working with the Z8. Our third location, Zurich, my home city. There I also do have two Z8 working with them. And UC Bern, where I had my alma mater, where I'm also doing the keratoplasties with the Z8. So in essence, I can clearly say that the Z8 is a machine which um, can be used for refractive purposes, on one hand to earn money, but also for therapeutic uh, purposes to heal and to cure um, diseases. So it's really a good mixture um, combining two worlds together, um, which I don't like to miss in any of my hospitals and uh, companies where I work. Thank you very much, team, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
Thanks, Sam. So I'd like to invite uh, Professor Awad. He's going to be talking about the latest results with the clear lenticular extraction procedure. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jad. Um, dear colleagues, I would like to uh, present uh, the latest results about clear lenticular extraction procedure, which is, of course, provided by Zimmer. Now, we all know that um, the Zimmer basically does a lot of stuff, the Zimmer Z8. It already performs like uh, Theo has shown us, LASIK, cornea ring segments, dog, flax, AK, CARES, and a lot of other things. It's very versatile, and it's really a multiverse. Um, what it provides, interestingly for CLEAR, is a low energy, and I think this is the key in providing a very smooth lenticle. Already again, Theo showed a lenticle extraction, really smooth but more importantly, flexible centration and rotation because of the way it applies on the cornea. And last but not least, ergonomics. Everything is done on the same setting under the same microscope. So um, a quick overview of how the procedure is being performed. So basically, I start with the slit lamp marking, and then I extend those slit lamp at uh, the microscope uh, with a three-prong marker centered on the vertex. And then when I dock, I can see my marks, which eliminates parallax, because I use them not only for cyclotorsion, but also to locate the vertex. Now the Zimmer has already an automated device, an automated algorithm to locate them. And using OCT, I can make sure that they have full applanation. And the procedure goes like that. This is the dissection of the anterior tunnel. Now, at the end of the learning curve, I, the surgeon would use the same incision, both for the anterior, as you can see here, and for the posterior, but basically dividing the incision. As you can see here, the posterior dissection became really smooth. And when I started, actually, not every femtosecond laser is the same. And when you start, you have to tweak the energy. And that's important to have some patience, some patience and to basically divide your load over several sessions in order to understand how your laser is reacting and to tune the energy accordingly. And sure enough, after four sessions, I could see a major change in the dissection. It's not the same laser anymore. It's a super-powered laser that could dissect anterior, posterior, even in the very high myopia, which I'm gonna show in a second, 9.75, really smooth dissection. Of course, for the uh, uh, transitioning surgeon, it's nice to keep the two incisions. One would be in the anterior, um, leading to the anterior interface, as you can see here, and one would be leading to the posterior interface, and this would, uh, make the transition super smooth and can also act as a safety net just in case for some reason you need the second incision. Again, um, for me it was great smooth transition even though now I use one incision. So how about the latest results with CLEAR? Now, if you look at the six month full data, so all these patients had full data. Um, there were 117 eyes with six month full data coming and having all kind of measurements um, and then, as you can see here, the MRIC was minus 4, but the um, uh, spheric equivalent varied from 1.6 to minus 9.75. Again, the astigmatism was up to 3 diopters in this series. Most of our uh, cap thickness, the average was 130, but we really experimented between 110 and 140, but the average uh, was 130. And then the optical zone, again, I tried to push as large as I can, but the average was 6.6, .6, going from 6.3 to 7. Interestingly, the post-op UDVA at six months was 97.4% 2020 and 65.8% 2015, 2016. We were reviewing all the data and we were really amazed that the patients kept coming at six months with really great results. CDVA, we have improvement of 40% improved one line of CDVA, 4% improved two lines, and only 6.5% lost one line. And these are patients who are 2015 and got 2020 by uh, uh, six months, and that very comparable to most of what we see the best platforms in femtolasic. In terms of spheric equivalent refractive accuracy, we can see that only 2% had more than half of adapter, plus or minus half of adapter, spherical equivalent uh, uh, final results, and as far as uh, astigmatism accuracy, only 3% were more than plus or minus half of adapter in terms of astigmatism. Stability, as you can see here, was pristine. The patients from day one to six months were pretty stable and did not show any of uh, the regression that we're afraid of. 
And when we look at the graph, the, the attempted versus achieved, as you can see here, it was right on target, even in the very high uh, myopic side, which you can see over there. If you look at uh, total corneal higher order aberrations preoperatively, the, the, the purple is 0.41 for total higher order and 0.21 for spherical uh, aberration. Uh, as you can see, not much induction of spherical aberration, typical in lenticular extraction, especially with large optical zone. And we, see, we saw mild in, uh, increase in, hori in um, uh, horizontal coma, something we know as well in lenticular extraction. I'm going to talk in a second what probably will really improve that significantly, and it's already available now. If we like to segment our data and look at the high myopia sub-analysis, uh, from those patients, we see that uh, from the 18 eyes who had high myopia from 6.35 to minus 9.75, with an average of 7.4 diopter, 94% were 20-20. And interestingly, uh, they, we had 24% 20, anyway uh, preoperatively. And basically, no patients lost any line of uh, vision. 50% were 2015 or better. Again, if you look at this, this um, uh, attempt that was achieved, again, is pretty tight. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, spherical equivalent. And again, if you look at stability, and we're always afraid with high myopes that with time they, they, uh, they regress. And interestingly, we, we used a 0.25 diopter of, um, uh, over, uh, of nomogram overcorrection in very high myope. And for uh, older patients, we didn't use any. And as you can see here, the, the, uh, the spherical equivalent was on target and kept stable over six months. And if uh, one thing one would really think is uh, the higher order aberration induction, because we saw all these studies about lenticle procedure versus uh, fake lens, and, and what would be our cutoff? So interestingly, for that, um, again, about 7.5 diopter of surrogate equivalence as an average, you could see that the total higher order aberration didn't increase much, uh, actually 0 0.3 diopter total. The spherical aberration increased only by about 0.2 diopter. That's pretty impressive for me. Again, we pushed into large optical zone, uh, but I mean, that's still pretty good. There's also small induction of horizontal coma. Um, if we look at corneal imaging, so first I'm going to talk about OCT scans. So uh, this is a post-op image showing the cap. If you measure the cap, that's a 130 cap, and that's almost the same. We know that the caliper error can be up to 10 microns, been published, so that's pretty good, and pretty a, a very good accuracy. If we look at Bowman's undulation, because that's something we know very well in lenticle, we kept playing around to, you know, in many, but not in all patients, achieve this very nice uh, um, Bowman's layer. And the trick here in all platform is to go deep and in smaller uh, 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 lenticles. The thicker the lenticle and the shallower, you will see uh, uh, undulations, like you can see this, and which we used to get before, even in lower uh, uh, correction, but with improvement in the settings. And then now those settings are come by default right now. We have a major change from what I saw there. But we still can get those, and they, interestingly, they don't affect vision. Um, if you look at tomography, this is a, um, a post-op minus four tangential curvature, because you know tangential curvature can show very, you know, can, can show a lot of uh, uh, noise, and that's still pretty good for a, a minus four first day. If you look here, this is minus 4.5, one day, and that's six months, and if you look at them, it's pretty stable. Nothing much has changed in that topography. I'm not sure if Cynthia can pick up something, but <laughs> overall here is pretty stable. Now, the keys to success for me, number one was the slit lamp marking, and then making sure that I extend those marks based on the vertex. Because for me, especially if you have a higher myope, if you're a little bit decentered, you're gonna end up with coma, and that might affect uh, uh, visual acuity. Of course, which is great, and I was waiting for it, and I changed my slide from soon is gonna be linked, now it is linked, the Galilei is linked right now, and I think this is gonna be a game changer, because the few induction in coma that's gonna go away, the suction time will be faster, and the uh, cyclotorsion will be target, you know, on spot. So that's something that finally is available and uh, you can check it out at the booth today. Um, large optical zone, because it is, it's definitely forgiving for any decentration. 130 microns is a happy medium. If, you know, uh, you could play around with 140 and 120, but 130 microns is a happy medium to get perfectly nice uh, Bowman's layer and yet be safe enough. So again, um, 
You could not even mark on the set lamp and with the Galilei, that's not gonna be needed at all. But right now, if you don't have the Galilei or if you're not, it's not linked yet, when I put those marks, I extend them again base. This is on the set lamp, that's on the microscope, and that's uh, the vertex, which is centered right there. Um, when you aplanate, there's no need, there's no room for parallax because now we have the three prongs that are actually marking the exact center. I don't like to put a, a, an ink mark right in, right in there. So with the three prong, I know that the center of the treatment is coinciding with the center of the vertex. Um, and then again, it, you can be, you, it can be used to eliminate cyclotorsion as well. So again, uh, stetla marking, extension of the marks on the vertex, and then finally docking and making sure there are no parallax. And by the way, the software of the Zima right now has an automatic algorithm where it detects the three uh, prongs and it will uh, centrate automatically. But you, you have a leeway to change accordingly. Again, all of that is not needed when the, if, if you link the Galilei in your practice. So finally, as a final thought, um, the clear is highly effective, it is stable, and most importantly, is super safe. And then what has been uh, 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 introduced as recent refinement in it, and with the Galilee being linked, will definitely take those results to a higher level. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jay. It's great. Okay, so do we have any, we have time for one or two questions. We have, uh, thanks to all the speakers for keeping the time we have within two minutes. So if you have any questions, there's some microphones uh, around the room. I'll just ask um, the guys some questions while we're just waiting for anybody to get to the microphones. Um, do you, you want to just, um, you made a comment about the solid state laser and the issues with gas now as well. Do you, can you give an idea of this amount of savings or something you'd have with a solid state machine over so a conventional gas um, excimer laser? I think for the future, it'll yeah, put on. Yeah. for the future, I think uh, there will be maybe a uh, game changer because um, it gets uh, more and more difficult to get the gas once. And uh, if the uh, solid state laser remains stable over a long time, then uh, it uh, would change also the applications. Uh, we. I think that's a uh, it's, it's um, uh, very important step and uh, something for the future. Yeah. Okay, that sounds great. And the, uh, Theo, you, you know, you showed a great talk of showing really the true uh, multiverse of the laser, and I think it's great to give people an idea of its use. So if you were going to give a percentage, how much of the laser you say you use for corneal therapeutic applications versus refractive? Um, I would say 80% refractive yeah. and 20% therapeutic. That's what my, but anyway, I'm, have, I'm doing 200 keratoplasties per year. Yeah. So therefore, I think for a regular basis, it's rather 90% refractive, maybe 10% uh, yeah. uh, therapeutic. Yeah, okay. But it's, I think it's nice to see what, you, what is doable with all the, basically, that software that's available uh, as well on the, on the machine. And Jelly, you showed some very fantastic results um, with the um, uh, clear. And, and as you said, basically, I think the thing that I like is the fact that we can basically reduce those incidences of first-generation lenticular procedures with the coma. And to me, as you show with the high myopia, you know, it's not that easy controlling your aberration, with spherical aberration, and also vertical coma in those situations. And I think that, you know, what you're showing with your data and then taking this forward, do you just make a comment about aberration control? Because I think that's a massive advantage with this being able to control the lenticular position. Thank you, John. I fully agree. And I think, uh, again, with the, with the linking of the Galilei, that's going to be much better. Because I think the higher you go with myopia, the more you really, perfect, you really need perfect centration. Yeah. Great. Okay. Do, uh, so any, do you have any questions from the audience? No. So if you want to have any further discussion about any of the applications that you are seeing, please come down to the uh, Zima booth. Um, they, everybody will be there until basically Tuesday. And, uh, or email any of us. We'll be happy to take any questions um, uh, from you as well. So I'd like to thank Zima for organizing uh, the symposium. Enjoy your rest of your meeting at ESCRS. Thank you.